thank you um, so much for inviting me um, here today to speak to you. I, I, I've been to the SIGGRAPH conference before, and this is a really great conference with a, a one number of wonderful talks, so I'm excited to be here. Before I start, actually, today, I wanted to, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we did to get the first image of a black hole that we presented to the world in April. But before I start talking about it, I just want to emphasize that this was a, a huge team effort, a huge global team effort to get this picture that required the effort of many people with lots of different kinds of expertise from different areas of astrophysics, math, and even computer graphics. So um, I, I just want to emphasize that before I get started. So black holes are one of the most mysterious objects in the universe, so that they're cloaked by an event horizon where extreme gravity prevents light from escaping them. Yet the matter that falls onto a black hole is superheated to hundreds and billions of degrees so that before it passes through the event horizon, it actually shines very brightly. And for that reason, although black holes are relatively small, um, they can often outshine the combined starlight of all the stars in their host galaxy. And for this reason, scientists have been studying black holes ever since they were first predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity just over 100 years ago. And in particular, for decades, scientists have been studying a giant elliptical galaxy at the head of the Virgo constellation. So this galaxy called M87 is 55 million light years away from us, and it's very special. 100 years ago, someone discovered a streak of light on the sky, which is a galactic scale jet of plasma shooting out of the center of the galaxy and marking the spot of a supermassive black hole. And over decades, scientists have tried to develop better and better instruments to study this supermassive black hole predicted to be at its center. And in April of 2017, an Earth-sized telescope collected the data necessary in order to make the first image of a black hole. And two years later, after processing the data, this is what we saw. But you might ask, you know, how were we able to take a picture of something that, by definition, doesn't let light es escape and is unseeable? Well, light propagating near a black hole doesn't actually follow straight lines. It's curved because the black hole is curving space-time, and photons can go, even go in complete circles around the black hole. So the space around it is lit up by this hot gas, as I was saying. It's heated up to hundreds of billions of degrees, and so you have photons that are flying around everywhere. And some of these are pointed towards the black hole and so fall in, but other ones are bent around it. So that the net effect is that the black hole casts a shadow on a backdrop of surrounding emission, causing this almost perfectly, perfectly cir circular shape. And if Einstein was right about general relativity, then this light would be bent to into a ring whose size and whose shape tell us about the mass and the spin of the black hole. And so if we were to see any deviations from general relativity, we would expect to see it in the shape of the shadow. And this ring is referred to as the black hole shadow. So simulations of turbulent plasma in the jets and the accretion disk around the black hole predicted it that if we had infinite, infinite resolution, we would see something like this. And so today I want to tell you how we were able, if we were, how we would, were able to take a picture of something like this, how did we verify what we recovered, and also how did we learn, learn about um, black holes from this picture, in particular use computer graphics to learn about these images. So what makes this so hard? Well, M87 is so small because it's so far away that even the Hubble telescope can only barely make out its booming jet on the sky. So since the black hole shadow requires a very particular type of telescope, it requires one that is just the right size and observing at just the right wavelength. And so at too short of wavelengths, like optical wavelengths that the Hubble telescope sees, the light is blocked from reaching Earth from within the core of the galaxy, often by dust within the galaxy. And similarly, at longer wavelengths, gas that shrouds the black hole blocks all the light from within. So even at three millimeter wavelength, the event horizon is not visible. This is a simulation of what um, theorists think it would look like at around three millimeters. But as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, theorists predict that eventually this ga gas becomes optically thin and we'd be able to see the event horizon. However, even though, even if we were able to successfully observe at these wavelengths, we face another huge challenge. And that's the size of this ring is incredibly small. So it's about 40 micro arc seconds in size, which is about the same size as a grain of sand, but when it's in New York and we're viewing it from here at SIGGRAPH in California. And so taking a picture of something that small is really, really hard. 
And so if we plug, plug in this wavelength and the required angular resolution that is necessary to see the black hole shadow into the diffraction limit equation, we can calculate that in order to see uh, this ring, we actually need a telescope that's 13 million meters across, uh, or about the size of the Earth. And if we could build an Earth-sized telescope, we could just start to make out that distinctive ring of light that's indicative of the black hole's event horizon. So although building a single-dish telescope the size of the Earth isn't possible, by joining telescopes located around the world, I've been working as part of an international collaboration called the Event Horizon Telescope that's building a that built a computational telescope that's the size of the Earth, capable of resolving structure on the scale of a black hole's event horizon. And joining telescopes in this manner is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry, or VLBI. And in VLBI, all of the telescopes in the worldwide network work together. So they're linked through the precise timing of atomic clocks at each of the sites. So teams of researchers at each site basically record um, thousands of petabytes of data, um, recording, sorry, petabytes of data that uh, by basically freezing the light onto these hard drives. And then our computers process the data to act like a lens to make that picture. But you know, how do we make a picture from this computational telescope? Um, well, unlike with a camera, in VLBI, we don't actually ca capture the picture in pixel space, but instead in frequency space. So we essentially take measurements of the black hole images for a transform. And if we put telescopes all across the globe, we would sample all these spatial frequency measurements. But since we only have telescopes at a few locations, that means we only get a sparse number of measurements. And it turns out that for every two telescopes in the telescope array, we get a single measurement of the underlying image's 2D spatial frequency that's related to the projected baseline between the telescopes. So the closer two telescopes are to each other, the smaller that baseline. And so the, that we measure lower frequencies, so we get large spatial structure. So to measure the fine detail we need to see that ring, we actually need to put our telescopes as far apart as possible. But even of the eight telescopes from the Event Horizon Telescope that were observed in 2017, only five of them are actually at different locations and were able to see the black hole in M87. And so that would only be five choose two, only 10 points to try to make an image from. However, as the Earth is rotating, we actually um, obtain other new measurements. So since the baselines between telescopes change as the Earth rotates, this amounts to carving out different elliptical paths in the spatial frequency plane. So we get these measurements by recording hundreds of terabytes of data at each telescope. And here you can see Lindy Blackburn with about half a petabyte of data that we recorded at the LMT telescope. And this is only about half the data we recorded at that site. And we record so much data that we can't send it over the internet and it's actually flown to a common location. <laughs> and then at that common location, we use a special purpose supercomputer called a correlator to combine pr the precisely timed data. And once this is done, this is passed on to a calibration stage, which finds weak signals hidden in the correlator output by tuning parameters to extract a stronger signal. And developing these calibration pipelines um, was really unique to the EHT data. And um, we had to develop pipelines that were unique to this data. And this was a huge endeavor led by Lindy Blackburn, but also with the help of many others, including Machek, Sarah, and Michael here. And without this getting this data, without this calibration process, we wouldn't have had the data we needed um, to, to make the images. But at this point, we have this data, and so we can kind of abstract away all the astrophysics and look at it as purely a computational imaging problem. So we have this sparse data, and our goal is to find the image that caused it. And if we were given measurements that covered the entire frequency plane, this would be trivial. You know, In the case of no noise, we would just simply need to take an inverse Fourier transform. But since we only see a few measurements, that means that there's actually an infinite number of possible images that are perfectly consistent with the data that we measure. So how do we deal with this? Well, the traditional method used in radio astronomy to, do, to deal with this is a method called clean. And clean works by first assuming that the data isn't really sparse, and it puts a zero everywhere where we haven't observed a measurement. And then by simply applying the inverse Fourier transform onto these measurements, the method that obtains this noisy, artifact-heavy reconstruction it doesn't really look like the original input image at all. But the method then kind of essentially throws away the data and it tries to say, I want to clean up this reconstruction. And it does it by making the assumption that the true underlying image should be composed of a bunch of point sources. And so it iteratively searches for the brightest point in the image and removes artifacts that would occur due to incomplete sampling in the frequency domain. And then this image is blurred together to merge the points into this um, extended source. <clears throat> 
So as I mentioned, this is the default method that is used in radio astronomy to make images. And the method works actually fairly well out of the box when there are a lot of telescopes and when they're observing at long wavelengths, such as what images that were produced by the VLA um, from the telescope that you see in the movie Contact. However, for short wavelengths, like the Event Horizon Telescope needs to operate at around one millimeter, getting an image is much harder. So there are a couple of reasons for this. However, one of the biggest ones is due to atmospheric noise. So the whole reason that VLBI, the EHT, is able to work in the first place is due to the fact that light from the black hole is going to be traveling to Earth for 55 million years. And when it reaches Earth, it's going to hit one of the telescopes slightly before the other one. And that time delay is key for extracting the 2D spatial frequency measurement that's used for image reconstruction. But when you have a different atmosphere in, um, um, in Chile than you do in Hawaii, than you do um, in Mexico, then each of these atmospheres adds an additional delay onto the signal which causes another random phase delay in the frequency measurement. And similarly, the atmosphere also causes a different attenuation factor in the signal, causing an absolute changing gain term. Other errors in the measurement can be introduced, such as things as defocus, pointing errors, astigmatisms, um, problems in the dish electronics. And so it turned out that actually for the Event Horizon Telescope, some of these were particularly a problem for the LMT. And the LMT was, um, the, the telescope I was actually at at the time, was in the process of being commissioned, and so it wasn't actually finished yet. And so it had no good way of pointing on sources yet. And so because it was such a large disk, it had some difficulty observing in the evening and morning and caused there to be these large gain errors. So ideally, you would want the gain to be a Route 1, but the gain was kind of all over the place for the LMT. And so these huge gain errors... Um, were, um, were ended up being quite a, a problem. And, and, and so we had quite a lot of error on the data. So ideally, we would measure this perfect Fourier component, the italicized V, with a, it has a nice amplitude and phase. But in reality, we actually have a completely random phase error that's caused a lot due to the atmosphere, and sometimes a pretty bad amplitude error as well. And so that's pretty terrible, because if we, at first glance, we've lost both our amplitude and our phase, so what do we really have left? And so in the case of just taking the inverse Fourier transform like you have to do for the initial image in the clean method, the image you get just ends up being totally scrambled. And cleaning up the scrambled reconstruction is really difficult. However, in this measurement term, notice that if we had a third telescope, then the measurements that are formed with that third telescope actually share some of the same corrupting terms, so G2 and Phi2. And once we, once we see this pattern, we can actually take advantage of this shared information when solving for images. So to do this, we developed two different classes of imaging algorithms that we explored when making images of MAB7. So in the inverse modeling one, um, this was based upon the traditional clean method, but because we can't use clean on its own, it was paired with something called self-calibration. And in self-calibration, we first saw for, the, um, for what we think the image looks like, and then once we have fixed the image, we saw for the gains and phases under the constraints shown before. Um, but this is the tra a traditional method, as I said, which is a huge plus because it's um, really validated within the community. It's understood within the community. But a big negative of the method is that because it, it ends up being quite sensitive to your initialization, and so it often needs a lot of guidance from a knowledgeable user, often by laying down what are called clean boxes, which are little boxes where you say, OK, this is where I believe the flux, the light should be. So. Um, and there are, but there are a lot of people that worked on getting these methods working for the HT data, so I just wanted to highlight um, them here. And a second approach of methods that, um, a class of methods that we've been developing more recently, and I've been doing working on these methods um, primarily with uh, Michael Johnson, Andrew Shale, and Kazu Akiyama, are on a forward modeling approach or regularized maximum likelihood methods. And in these methods, we don't try to find an inverse function that takes us directly from the measurement to a picture, but instead we try to picture that both fits the measurements and is defined as likely through some sort of prior. And so the disadvantage here is that we have to define what is a likely image, um, and that always introduces bias. But the huge advantage of these methods is that we can naturally incorporate other types of error. And so, for instance, we can directly try to optimize an image with constraints that are insensitive to these, the errors I talked about earlier. And we typically do that through constraints known as closure quantities. 
So in a closure phase, for instance, you add up when you, so each, between two telescopes, you have a measurement with an amplitude and a phase. And so if you add up the phase between um, measurements from a closed loop of telescopes, it turns out that the additional phase caused by that crazy atmosphere actually cancels out completely and you're left with a term that is the same as if you didn't have any atmosphere at all. And similarly, in a quantity called closure amplitudes, if we multiply and divide the measurements of four telescopes in a certain order, we obtain a term where the gains cancel out perfectly and we're left with a term that's the same as if the gains were all one. And so both of these closure quantities were actually determined a long time ago, but they're typically used for calibration purposes. However, rather than just using them for calibration, we actually constrain these properties and are able to make image assume, assuming no calibration whatsoever in our data. So we do this by modeling the forward system as a function f of, f, f of x that returns these robust data products, the closure phase and closure amplitude in the, that we'd expect to see if the true image was actually x hat. And then we compare it to the actual fa noisy phase closure measurements y hat by computing the data likelihood. And this allows us to determine how consistent our proposed reconstruction is with the observed data while being invariant to that nasty air that plagues our measurements. And through the data likelihood, we can also naturally incorporate other types of air that we expect to see on measurements from the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, and then by incorporating some sort of image prior or regularizer that scores how reasonable each image is, we can actually optimize um, to find the, the final image that we show in the end and settle on an image such as this one. So by using this framework, we actually found out we could recover reasonable reconstructions even when the data was really poor. So for instance, here we're showing reconstructions done when we're always assuming in all cases that the phase is terrible, that we basically have random phase, but in the top row, we're constraining the absolute amplitude. In the bottom row, we're constraining that closure amplitude information. And notice as you add more and more gain error, more of that amplitude error, um, when, when we're using only the closure quantity as the bottom row, we're, and we're invariant to it. And so this was a huge development for the project because it allowed us to actually reconstruct images from the incredibly noisy data before full calibration was done. But even if we came up with some new great methods, the question still remains of how do we make sure we're not biasing our images too much? So we have this really sparse, really noisy data and all the images methods that we have inject some sort of information into the problem about what images look like, whether it is through those clean boxes, through the human, um, through in the clean method by laying down where you think the flux should be or through an image prior or regularizer in the regularized maximum likelihood methods. And so we didn't want to accidentally inject some sort of information that it should be look like a ring, for instance, and then be really excited that we got a ring back. And so we needed to be very careful with these assumptions. And so to do this, we put together a four step process. And the first step of this process was to actually um, started years before we collected data, and that was to test ourselves on synthetic data. And so we did this um, by designing what we called the Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Challenges. And in these challenges, we had a team of people that would simulate realistic data sets that were then distributed without any knowledge of what the underlying source was that were used to generate those data sets. And that data had all the kind of crazy errors that we expected to see. And then from this data, different people use their different favorite methods to reconstruct what they thought their best guess at the image was. And then once this was done, this was passed on to a team of experts that would look at these images and try to decide, okay, do I believe what I'm seeing? What don't I believe? And this is very similar to what we actually had to do eventually for the real data. Um, but unlike with the real data, we actually had the true image in the end so we could compare it. So I wanna show you a few examples of things we saw in these challenges and what we learned from them. So here's one example. At the, on the top, it is showing the true underlying image, and it blurred to about half the resolution of the EHT interferometer. Um, and on the bottom are submissions that people, different people did with different methods um, without any knowledge of what the, the true image was on the top. And notice that each image looks slightly different. They all look, have you know, slightly different things about them, but they all still contain the same underlying structure. So you notice that there's this same kind of ring shape, crescent shape that's brighter on the left side than the right side. But there are differences. Some of them have wispy structures that others don't. And so by comparing across different independent methods, um, you actually see that you can try to build up confidence in certain features and reject other ones. Another thing we did is threw crazy images at it. So. Uh, uh, one reason I like to show this image is because you know clearly no one who was doing these challenges was expecting a snowman to be at the center of the M87 galaxy, 
But, you know, it was really good to show that our imaging methods weren't expecting it. And so we were able to see this kind of surprising structure, although people's interpretations of it were very weird. But, um, but you got in all these cases, you know, something surprising that didn't look like what we expected black holes to look like, and that was really important too. So based on these synthetic data tests, we developed how we were gonna actually approach the M87 data. So we wanted to avoid shared human bias like we had done in the imaging challenges in order to assess common features among independent reconstructions. And so we split about 40 people who worked on imaging, either they developed methods or they're just very good at using imaging methods, into four different imaging teams that globally span the Earth. And these four teams actually, when we got the data um, last June, we were actually not able to even talk to each other at all during the imaging process for seven weeks. And we worked in isolation for those seven weeks trying to make the best image from the data. And after that time, we all gathered together in, um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we revealed the images to one another. And this is actually what we saw. So this was really quite amazing. Although each picture was different, they all reconstructed the same basic structure. So there's a ring of roughly 40 micro arc seconds that's brighter on the bottom than the top. And you know, seeing these images was one of the happiest moments that I've had in the collaboration that a lot of people had because it brought a whole other level of confidence to the results. Although within, when we got the data, within you know, minutes we were making pictures, it wasn't until we saw that different people with different methods got the same underlying structure that we really started to believe it. So um, here we are um, after we showed the images to each other on that day and the average of those four images and, the, uh, and all the people that were working on the imaging um, for it. So, um, but once we had done this, we still wanted to make sure that we weren't imposing some sort of human bias. So we spent the next couple of months trying to essentially break our images. And so the first thing we tried is actually to objectively choose parameters to remove humans from the loop as much as possible and see if we still get this ring. So to do this, we developed three different imaging pipelines that all have their individual knobs on them that are usually tuned by a human user. But instead of having a human tune them, we instead search for the best set of knobs to recover different types of source structures. So for instance, we generated synthetic data as if the Event Horizon Telescope were seeing a disk on the sky rather than with, that had no hole in the center. And then we found the best imaging parameters to, to recover that disk shape. And then we transferred these exact parameters onto the M87 data. And when we did this, we found that the data required that we put a hole in the center. And by doing this simple training and testing procedure on many different types of underlying sources, we saw that our methods always preferred this ring shape. And that was true no matter the day we observed M87 on or the imaging code that was used to reconstruct it. And so by blurring the images from different um, algorithms, different methods to a a common resolution, we then average them together to form the image that we showed to the rest of the world on April 10th. So this basic structure, a ring of light that's brighter on the bottom than the top. So once we had made these images, though, we still weren't sure. So we wanted to make sure, again, with a number of validation tests. And we did a number of these. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them, but you can look in the papers if you're interested to see more details. So the easiest one to understand is the independent day test. And that's that we observed M87 over four different nights, and we used the exact same code on each night, and we got a very similar picture uh, in all of them. So it's not like the ring just appeared in one day and didn't appear the other days. Um, and actually, it's interesting. If you look at these images, you'll notice that there is a little bit of variation across them, and that's because we do expect M87 to vary over a week span. But in general, the basic structure is the same in all of them. Another validation test we did was looking at various variations across different parameters. So remember when we were selecting that beta, those, those parameters to, to best tune the methods, we only selected, at that time I talked about only selecting one parameter. But why is one parameter set better than any other one? We actually felt that there was a whole set of parameters that are acceptable and gave us reasonable reconstructions. So what we did is found the set of beta such that the reconstructed images when you computed the normalized cross-correlation with the true images was higher than that of the true image when blurred to the intrinsic resolution of the interferometer. And that gave us just not one parameter set, uh, but a whole collection of parameters. So for example, for the EHT imaging pipeline, we had about uh, 1,500 parameters that we found by searching over hundreds of thousands of images and simulations. And so over the course of the uh, pipelines, uh, we surveyed tons and tons of values 
And we selected a, a small number of them based upon which ones performed well on the synthetic data. So here is showing a slice of just two of the parameters that we searched over in one of the parameter surveys. And, um, and the green boxes are showing the ones that were selected based upon their performance on a set of synthetic data. Um, one thing I also want to highlight about this image is that in the top left, you see this image, uh, this, um, this box in yellow. And th in that image, actually that image required no additional regularization, regularization, image regularization, other than the fact that the image was positive and light is positive and that the image was compact. And so actually this data was so beautiful um, more so than most of the synthetic data we ever generated, that we could get a ring even with very um, little constraints. Um, so we also did it for a number of other pipelines that I talked about here are some images from the SMILEY um, parameter survey and the DIFMAP parameter survey. So once we had these images, so for instance, the 1500 for the EHT imaging survey, we could look across them for variations. So we took all these images, we aligned them, and we could look at the standard um, deviation and see that, okay, there were regions in that ring that we have less confidence of. Um, these, specifically, these bright three knots in, on the bottom have, we, you know, have more variation, but they're still significantly less than the total intensity of the ring. So if you look at the fractional standard deviation, you notice we have a lot of confidence in that ring shape. It appears in basically all our reconstructions, but the, all the stuff on the outside, all that wispy structure, we really aren't sure of, and so you shouldn't believe that. And so another test we did after this was actually looking at the gains. So remember, we had these corrupting terms. We lose um, the absolute phase information, and uh, we also um, lo lose a lot of the amplitudes as well. But, you know, and, and these were terms that we basically had to solve for during the imaging, as I said. But not all sites actually lose their full amplitudes, so we could actually weakly constrain it. And one thing we observed is that when we interleave, so when we observed M87 with the Event Horizon Telescope, we just didn't sit on M87 the whole night. We actually looked at M87, then we looked at another source, then back at M87. And so by, inter by independently imaging both of these sources and comparing their calibration terms, we could see that over the course of the night, if they agreed with one another. And by plotting, um, at the top was an image of 3C279, which is an AGN that we also image at the same time. And you can see the gains of the two sources really align with each other for the different um, telescope sites. But you might think, okay, you know, some of these have really bad amplitudes. For instance, I, I highlighted the LMT having these issues. So perhaps this is really screwing us up. So maybe we should just drop the site altogether. But if you actually drop a site, because we only had five different locations of sites, if you drop down to four, you're actually losing 40% of the, the baselines we, that we have. And so it's, although we still sometimes make out that ring, it's a lot harder to do. And, and when we're losing Chile, for instance, we basically get nothing. So rather than dropping the sites altogether, we instead decided to look at what happens when we ignore the calibration and use only the closure phase and closure amplitude information for imaging, what I discussed earlier in the talk. And when we did this, when we ignored the absolute amplitudes altogether, um, we still recovered that ring back at the end. And I think that's quite amazing. This image on the right didn't require any calibration during the imaging. And we still get that ring shape. And so the last thing I'll talk about today is uh, model fitting. And model fitting actually was a whole paper <laughs> unto itself. So I'm not gonna be doing it justice by a few slides. But, um, but one thing that I think it's important to highlight is that once we got these images, we could also ask, you know, what were some of the features of these images and are they consistent across, across the different images we saw? And so we used very, very simple methods. Yeah. Simple methods to recover the diameter of the ring from all of these images from the parameter surveys. And then we compared these diameters we got across um, the different um, images to one another. And we found that no matter the method that we used or the day that we observed M87 on, that we were very consistent in the diameter of the ring that we got out in the end. And so that got, gave us a lot of confidence in the, in the size. And we looked at other features as well, although the ring is, this diameter is one of the most robust features. But we didn't actually need to recover the, adjust the ring from the recovered images. We could also fit, for instance, a crescent model. Um, so we didn't actually need to image directly. We could do some sort of sampling method to fit um, uh, crescent models to the data. And we saw, no, even when we use these um, very simple structures, we could, also, we could fit the um, data with rings that were about the same size as we were seeing in our image reconstructions. 
Um, and so this was very consistent with imaging and also gave us a lot of confidence. So one thing you may have picked up on is that every step in this process, from taking the petabytes of data we collected at the telescope down to the few numbers that we extracted um, for the ring size, we, they were actually checked multiple times. So not only the imaging had multiple methods, but correlation was actually done at two different sites. Um, and uh, calibration was done by three different pipelines. The imaging, as I discussed, was done by a number of different pipelines as well. And in, in model fitting, we also used different techniques to, to extract the image features. And so it was really important that we double check every step of the pipeline um, using different methods. And that's because we were using this computational telescope for the first time. And so we wanted to make sure every, everything was being done properly. But one question you might have at this point is, you know, what did we actually learn? So did we prove, for instance, Einstein was right? And the short answer is, well, no, but we also didn't prove he was wrong, which is also a big thing. <laughs> so if you take, for instance, a fixed size mass, we can calculate the short shell radius that we would need to compress it down to in order to get a black hole. But actually, what we generally expect to see is not the event horizon itself, but actually the point at which uh, or, um, photons orbit nearly indefinitely um, on this photon orbit. But even that is not exactly what we expect to see. So actually due to the immense gravity around a black hole, this photon orbit is actually lensed out to a bigger size. Um, so for a non-spinning black hole, the diameter that we see of that photon orbit is about 5.2 times the short shell radius. And for a maximally spinning, spinning, spinning black hole, it's a bit smaller, 4.8 times the short shell radius. And so this small range of diameters between 4.8 and 5.2, the short shell radius, is the range that we would expect that ring, the size of the ring for canonical general relativity for a black hole. But notice that this directly depends on the mass of the black hole. So for a smaller black hole, this ring actually becomes smaller. And that's interesting because actually from past measurements of M87's mass, it was actually really unclear what the mass was. So gas dynamics pointed us to a value of about a black hole mass of about three and a half billion solar masses, while stellar dynamics pointed us to something closer to six and a half to seven billion solar masses. And stellar dynamics provided an upper limit as there couldn't have been more mass within the stellar orbit than from just the black hole. So we wouldn't expect uh, a ring any bigger than the yellow one. But then we could ask ourselves, okay, how do we turn this into a test of black holes? Well, we could look at other unusual exotic objects. So for instance, wormholes also produce shadows, but for a same size black hole, for a six and a half billion solar mass black hole, they're actually much smaller of a ring feature. Um, and naked singularities or super splitting black holes also produce shadows, but they're even smaller. And when you lay the EHT image on top of them, you instantly actually rule out all these other exotic possibilities and are left with a ring that matches nearly perfectly with the stellar dynamical measurement of the black hole mass for canonical GR. And so this is just one of the many things that we can learn about black holes and gravity by studying this image. But perhaps one of the most amazing things that we see is that by comparing this picture to simulations scientists have made for years, we find that the image we took is actually amazingly consistent with a number of these predictions. And so I want to highlight the importance of computer graphics in this discovery. So computer graphics was not just something that came after the fact, but something that actually drove scientists in their quest to take a picture of a black hole and have since allowed us to interpret what we're seeing. And so for that reason, although I'm, I don't, I'm not really personally a computer graphics researcher, I just want to give a really, really short um, history of black hole graphics. And I think you all will hopefully appreciate it. So although the first modern solution of general relativity that would characterize a black hole was found by Carl Schwarzschild in 1916, it actually wasn't until the 70s that people began to make figures of what they expected a black hole to look like. And in 1917, James Bardeen computed how a black hole's rotation would affect the shape of the shadow that the event horizon casts on a back, uh, backdrop of a star field. And around the same time, C.T. Cunningham, who was under the supervision of Bardeen, was writing up his PhD thesis at University of Washington in Seattle, and he began to calculate uh, what the optical appearance of a, stellar, um, a star in circular orbit would look like. So although these pictures gave us, or these figures gave us the first glimpse of how a black hole distorts the space-time and its environment, it wasn't until Jean-Pierre Luminet that we saw actually what we would consider the first idea of what we would think a photograph would look like. 
So this simple diagram by Lumine helps to describe what you would expect to see for a thin disk of gas around a black hole. And in this diagram, we're viewing the black hole at a 10 degree angle. Um, and so the light coming from the thin disk of gas in front of the black hole actually projects this primary image onto the, photo, uh, onto the plate, and the, which is showing up as that more orange color. But the light from behind the black hole is not obscured like it would be if it were like the rings of Saturn. But instead, the top of the disk gets actually bent around to the primary image um, at the top. And then the bottom of the disk actually bends, gets bent to what is called a secondary image. And using this intuition in 1979, Lumine set out to make the first graphic rendering of a black hole. So by using an IBM 7040 mainframe, which was an early transistor computer with a bunch of punch card inputs, he was able to actually calculate the curves that show the apparent path of rays emitted at a constant radius from the black hole. But this on its own actually wasn't enough to still make a picture. So due to an effect called Doppler beaming, gas that is actually moving towards us, because it's moving so fast, it actually uh, is brighter than when the gas is moving away from us. And so by taking this Doppler effect into account, he also used the computer to calculate curves of constant apparent luminosity around the black hole. And by combining these two calculations, he then set out to render what a black hole image would look like. But due to the lack of at least easily available computer graphics software at the time, he actually created the image by hand. Using the numerical data from the computer, he actually drew directly on paper with black India ink each of these little dots. Um, which he then was a negative that he turned into this, pot, this image. And he placed the dots uh, more densely where the simulation showed more light. So although this was an incredibly painstaking process, it produced the first like, beautiful image that we see of what we, th what we would think a black hole would look like. And over the years, these simulations improved. So with new processing power in the late 80s and 90s, computers were then able to more easily simulate what a black hole would look like from a number of different observing positions. And if you look at some of these renderings, you'll notice that they actually share striking resemblance to the image of Gargantua in the movie Interstellar. So although the Interstellar image contains um, more detail and was rendered nearly 25 years later, I find it really amazing that the bulk properties here are very similar to what was first predicted in the seven, late 70s. But you might notice that there's one feature that's missing from the interstellar image, and that's that one side of the ring is not brighter than the other like it is in this other picture. And that's because despite Kip Thorne asking to include it, it was actually decided for artistic purposes to leave it out so the black hole would be more understandable to an audience. However, this Doppler effect is actually very important to include in simulations of black holes because it helps to tell us a lot. So for instance, notice in the black hole image of M87 that we created, the bottom is brighter than the top. And that's because the gas at the bottom of the disk we think is moving um, towards us faster while the, while the gas at the top is moving away from us. And so this asymmetry tells us that the black hole is actually spinning away from us. And something we didn't know we didn't know about MA87 before the EHT observations. So anyway, getting back to the computer graphics story, story, computer graphics renderings such as these and ones done by Heino Falke in 2000 were actually inspiration for developing the Earth-sized telescope that would make it possible to directly observe this predicted structure. And so without these computer graphic renderings, it's likely we would have never even attempted to see a black hole. But since these early days of computer graphic renderings of black holes, there's been a huge amount of work that has been going into developing what are called GRMHD simulations of them um, that are then later ray traced. And these simulations and graphic renderings are getting more and more sophisticated each year. However, all these simulations actually depend on a huge number of possible initial conditions and simulation choices. So rather than just simulate one video, the EHC actually decided to make a huge effort to collect simulations of black holes with many different kinds of conditions. And so groups at Radboud, UIUC, um, Frankfurt, and Harvard actually got together and they put together over 60,000 simulation snapshots of black holes with different properties that we could then to, uh, to interpret what we were seeing. And so we've learned a lot by studying these simulations and comparing our recovered black hole image to them. But for example, these simulations help us to more accurately weigh the black hole we are seeing. So by simulating the data from these different simulations, and running our feature extraction methods, either through imaging or specifically through model fitting, we could try to better calibrate the mass to the recovered diameter we get. 
And by applying this calibration procedure to each of the different ways that we recover the black hole's diameter, um, from the geometric model fitting to the image domain to even fitting directly to those simulations, we found that all aligned very well with each other and we got the same mass um, uh, that predicted the, the stellar dynamical measurement I talked about before of about six and a half billion solar masses. And I just wanna highlight a few names here, Avery, Paul, Dom, Jason, and Ferriel, along with others really helped to, to push forward this calibration and, and model fitting um, process. So by studying this image, we have the best evidence as of yet that black holes exist as well as a way to study and learn about the immediate environment around a black hole. You know, how black holes accrete matter and how they impact their host galaxies. But although we've already learned so much by imaging M87, we're already looking towards the future and thinking about new sources that we can image um, to learn even more. So for instance, another prime target for the Event Horizon Telescope is the black hole in our own backyard called Sagittarius A star, or Sag A star for short. But due to Sag A stars, it's actually, because it's a much smaller black hole, it's actually evolving incredibly quickly. So uh, whereas it, uh, it takes about four to 30 days to have a full orbit of gas around M87, for Sag A star, it's actually four to 30 minutes. So over the course of a night, it's evolving incredibly quickly. And that means in order to study Sag A star in detail, we have to rethink imaging basically from the ground up. So by linking computational theorists who make computer graphic renderings of how they expect Sag A star to evolve with instrumentalists who think of new ways to improve our Earth-sized telescope, perhaps by even going to space, and intelligently merging this information using new computational imaging and feature extraction methods, we've been able to start making progress in studying these challenging sources. And hopefully one day we'll be able to show you not just a static image of a black hole, but actually a dynamically changing, a breathing black hole video. And so we're really just at the beginning. Now that we have this new extreme laboratory where we can continue, we can continue to go back and test general relativity and study black holes up close. And so we're already thinking of, uh, towards the future of ways that we can go about improving our instrument and in improving our algorithms together to learn even more. And so with that, thank you. I think we have time for a question or two. Maybe turn up the lights a little so people don't fall. Uh, I'm curious why you can't interfere a telescope with itself using the precise timing data and thus use the Earth's motion to create a much longer baseline. The data that we get from the black hole is based essentially um, data from a Gaussian process. And so you have to no correlate two different locations from exactly the same time. So we can't, for instance, some people ask, oh, why can't you use data you collect at one time, um, one day of the year with data you collect at a different time of the year? And that's because you can't, the data, the, the signal that you're receiving is actually a different signal. And so we actually have to look at basically that, that time delay information um, that we get from uh, how that data is being collected at one site relative to another site on Earth at the exact same time. So you can't use the same big data at the same site, although we do have data, for instance, at the ALMA site, I'm sorry, in Chile and in Hawaii, we have two telescopes at the same location that are not on the same receiver. They're a completely different path, but they collect data, you know, like a kilometer apart or something like that, and uh, even less maybe for Hawaii. And so that we can use that to get basically what the total flux, the total intensity of the light of the black hole is. Hello, um, the, uh, two questions. Do you think uh, you can capture something that is different uh, than the black hole? And uh, do you plan to capture a well-known object in the space uh, to evaluate the, the quality of the reconstruction? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm trying to go back to, I don't know if I see my mouse. Uh, I'll just go back. Um, so yeah, we, we, so because this is the first telescope that can actually observe at this kind of resolution and at that wavelength, we don't actually have any other objects that we can look at that we know what they should look like for that resolution and that wavelength. However, we do look at other objects other than um, the structure on the scale of the, the event horizon. 
Um, sorry, let me just get back here. Oh, I think I went too far. Okay, so we look at other um, sources at the same time. So as I mentioned, we looked at act other active galactic nuclei where we can't resolve that event horizon scale structure, but we still see other things. So for instance, here is an image of 3C279, which is a very famous AGN, and the jets that are coming out of the black hole. So you can't see that, that ring structure, but you can still see something about the jets coming off. And we look at other lots of AGN, and these AGM are studied at different wavelengths. So for instance, we have data at three millimeter wavelength and seven millimeter. And so although it doesn't look the same as at one millimeter, we know roughly the direction that the jets are coming off. And so we know roughly where we expect the emission to be. And so by doing that, and we actually spent a lot of time about like seven months or so imaging 3C279 before we even allowed ourselves to look at the M87 data, because we wanted to check that our methods were working on real EHT data and getting something that was reasonable in the direction that we expected to see. So. Thank you. Hi. Um, in computer graphics, there's quite a long history of temporal, sort of uh, using temporal information to increase resolution. Obviously, because the, the spinning black hole has a lot of randomness in the data and you don't know about yeah. the correlation, is th was any temporal uh, upscaling or, or sort of resolution improvement used? And if not, can it be used to help the resolution? Yeah, so we've been developing methods right now that do connect it, the data in time to try to um, propagate information. So it's not like um, I don't have I can I don't have the time I guess to go through it now. But if you're interested, I can talk about it um, offline. But where instead of just trying to reconstruct the image of each snapshot of data, which is just we just don't have enough information for, we're developing methods to propagate that information to create the best video by assuming something like some sort of uh, smoothly evolving structure or some kind of static flow field. So these are things that we're uh, actively developing. But there's you know there, these this is some new kinds of methods that are are we really ha are developing because of Sag star and, and what the challenges we're facing in it. Okay, great. Um, I want to, before we thank our speaker again, I want to uh, mention that she's going to be partaking in the um, Women in CG panel uh, this afternoon. Um, with that, uh, let's thank Katie one more time. And...